This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode I chat with the world's best writers about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Now today is a crossover episode I recorded with Max Booth III of Ghoulish Podcast. So what you're hearing will air on both This Is Horror and Ghoulish. You see, as of a few days ago, I released my debut novel, House of Bad Memories. And in around a week, Max will release his brand new book, The Last Haunt. And both House of Bad Memories and The Last Haunt are available via Cemetery Gates Media. So we decided to team up, and the conversation you're about to hear is the result. But before we get into it, a quick advert break. Our Share of Night, the acclaimed novel by Mariana Rodriguez, is about a young father and son who set out on a road trip, devastated by the death of the wife and mother they both loved. Soon they must confront her demonic family, a cult that commits unspeakable acts in search of immortality. Our Share of Night by Mariana Rodriguez is available now. Everyone has a story about post-haste manner. None of them end well, but that doesn't stop the hopeful from hoping and the desperate from trying. This Halloween, authors Jolie Tumajon and Carson Winter present Post-Haste Manor, the history and eulogy of one very haunted house. As recounted by the artists, poets, beloved family pets, and mass murderers who have been touched by it. Raise a glass in celebration. Just don't linger for too long. Post-Haste Manor, out October 18th, from Tenebrous Press. Okay, with that said, here it is. It is Max Booth third. On This Is Horror. So Max, let's talk about your forthcoming book, The Last Haunt. So what inspired this book? Just a bunch of deep diving into extreme haunted house attractions like Russ McCamey and like the blackout haunted house and a, a bunch of other extreme haunted houses that I'm, I'm blanking on with the name now. But I think the most well-known one to the public is probably uh, Russ McCamey's uh, haunted house because he's such a, an odd human and he's fun to talk about. So the book isn't based on him or anyone specifically. It's just, um, you know, inspired by some of the ideas and topics these uh, extreme haunted houses bring up. Yeah. And I mean, when did you first discover Russ McCamey or when did you first discover like these kind of haunted house? Yeah. uh, Extreme attractions for, for want of better phrasing. I think it was a Netflix documentary called um, Haunting, Hauntilds. I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the name now. It has haunt in the title. But it was a documentary about people who make those haunted house attractions. Not all the, the attractions featured in the doc were extreme, but Resp is like the extreme exa- uh, example they provided. And it just seemed really... Um, interesting i guess and possibly uh, not really ethical maybe so i um just began googling and reading about him and watching videos people had made and eventually like discovering like the mccamey main little exposed facebook group which is a secret facebook group of people who despise this man to death <laughs> <laughs> that they want to see his whole like his business uh, done um just so lots of 
just reading and compiling information and trying to decide what was true about the attraction and what was uh, like an illusion that McKamey had made to advertise the haunted house attraction. We can get into this later on, but like when people, when people who don't, know a lot about McKamey, talk about McKamey, they kind of just say, oh, he's that guy who is nuts and will cut you open and do all types of crazy uh, chill uh, devices to your body and there's nothing you could do about it, and he's crazy. Well, I mean, the crazy pill is probably true, but uh, in my uh, research, I kind of discovered he doesn't even have a haunted house. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's really interesting watching these like different documentaries and YouTube videos and theories on him because obviously you got some people who are like this, this is the most extreme haunt to ever exist, and then you've got other people who are like, look, it, it's not a manor. This is like this, this is a room in this guy's house. There is no manor. We're we're exposing it, and yeah, so. Back, he used to have the haunt in San Diego, California, and he did have an actual haunt in San Diego. But for uh, unexplained reasons, he uh, packed up and moved everything to Tennessee. And that was when it went from being a haunt to being like a boot camp, basically. Yeah. So now what it basically is, is um, he has people do like <laughs> exercises in his front uh yield like sit ups mm. and push ups and yeah the most he might do is he'll uh <laughs> he'll blindfold you and spray you in the face until you tap out or die. <laughs> but he doesn't yeah. have like uh decorations. He doesn't have like a like a like actual just like most haunted house attractions they have uh, people in costume and who help out. He doesn't really have those now like he used to in San Diego and like one bit of speculation is he left due to owing uh, taxes in, in San Diego, but I mean, that's just speculation. I don't know what's true or not. Uh, it might explain a few things. Um, also, when he moved to San Diego, I mean, when he moved from San Diego and set up in Tennessee, he announced like this big prize. Like, if you can make it through my haunted house, I'll give you $20,000, which, uh, does not exist like no one's ever even <laughs> come close to winning and if someone does come close to making it through he will uh basically call it quits like one famous example was this marine who was doing it and, and Russ was like oh no he's gonna he's he's catching hypothermia i gotta i gotta pull this right now before you die <laughs> but it was obvious he wasn't gonna give up so that's why Russ gave up um I mean, it's such a vast topic that I don't even know, like, what to focus on without, like, a specific question. But before we continue talking about my book, we're also promoting a book you wrote that's also coming yeah. out through the same press. And um, I, the press is called Cemetery Gates Media. It's a – I don't know much about this press, to be honest. I, uh, it's owned by a man named Joe – uh, Will's, Will's Joe based out of? Do you know? I believe United that. States. Yeah, he's de definitely based in the United States. I thought you wanted more specific information, <laughs> but that, that's okay. We don't we don't need to give his address away on on a podcast. <laughs> What's so, his yeah. social security then? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he, he he's based in the U.S. How did yeah. you um? What was your first introduction to Cemetery Gates Media? Because I think they might kind of be a new press, right? Well, I mean, they they've been about for a number of years now. I don't I don't know exactly how many, but in in my mind, I feel like maybe about two thousand and eighteen, two thousand and nineteen. Um, but I can tell you, the first kind of professional interaction. I had with them was when one of my short stories, Teka Teka Teka, which is based in Japan, it, it, it was submitted to a folklore anthology stories from around the world. And yeah, that, that got accepted. And so that was the first publication and first proper 
interaction with Joe and Cemetery Gates Media, but I I knew of them before that, so it wasn't seeing the anthology called uh, that made me first aware of them. I I I just think that um I'm trying to think who who were the what were the first books that made me aware of them. I think mine I, I, was Six Rooms. Who wrote Six Rooms? Yeah, Gemma Ramore. Yes. I did I did I did wonder if it was if it was Gemma. So but not only was Joe and Cemetery Gates Media putting out, you know, high quality books by people like Gemma Ramore and Paul Mike. Is it Paul Michael Anderson or is that the director? I didn't know that. that who's, who's the really similarly named director? Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah, I, I was in the same way. Yeah, it is Paul Michael Anderson. That is his, his actual name. I know I was going to tell people I already put out a, a book by the film director. He did not. It was Paul so Michael. I've published Paul Michael Anderson, like a book of his as well. And I definitely, we had that confusion a lot. But like we kept calling him Paul thomas Anderson. yeah and i've known paul michael Anderson since the, the beginning of my career he yeah. uh he accepted one of my really early like professional sales rates really it's for a magazine he was editing called uh J Ma Vu, which uh, lasted like three issues before going bankrupt yeah oh, no. oh dear well it happens yeah well, it ha happens a lot with with magazines and and well, with small presses as well, yeah, I think that this isn't. But now we're getting into territory where it's like, yes. did, we, did we start like uh, complimenting Paul Michael Anderson, and now this is like the, the shitting on Paul Michael Anderson? He wasn't. Right? He wasn't publishing it. In fact, the, the okay, company that good. published it kind of fucked a few of us over by not paying people, uh, and. They ended up folding not that long ago. Well, maybe it was long yeah. ago. I have no concept of time because they were yeah. uh, not treating people the way uh, people should be treated. But enough about bad presses. Um, Simon Tilly Gates, probably a good press. Julie's still out, right? Let's see how these books are. <laughs> 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 uh, tell, tell me about the book you have coming out with them. I know I've read it once, but, you know, for the audience's sake. Yeah, and and seeing as you said, the jury is still out with Cemetery Gates Media. I mean, he 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 paid me the advance very very quickly and and in full. So uh, with blood money, we should say <laughs> we we don't know that. <laughs> We're only speculating. We don't not know that though. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't specify whether it was or wasn't blood money. The the money was sent to me. I didn't ask as to where, where did you acquire this money from, sir. It just went into the account. No questions asked. But House of Bad Memories. So, I mean, the way that I've been pitching it is that it is funny games meets this is england with a rosemary's baby undertaste those are kind of the comps and in terms of in terms of what inspired it or where the idea came from i mean initially this was a novella initially this was a novella that was going to be published by another press and so it, it's very much a novel of of two halves and the first half it was kind of in, influenced and tapped into i guess some some childhood trauma and some unpleasant issues during my childhood yeah max is rubbing his hands together he's like oh this is this is the good stuff <laughs> and uh much like uh, you know the 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 haunt in the the last haunt, I decided let's take that to the extreme. Let's you know take the childhood trauma and abuse even further and extrapolate what what could have happened. Um, but yeah, it, it was due to come out via a press, but then there, there were a few things that. It, it really minor things, in fact, that I wasn't so happy about. And then I got the rights back. And then when I had the rights back, 
you know, that this was a year or so later, I could decide, well, what do I want to do with it now? And at that time, I mean, as with any story that I write, and I think the same with you, I send the story to Ryan Lewis, a film agent, to see, okay, what, what does he think about this? And does he think it's something that he could potentially sell the film rights to? And whilst he enjoyed the original House of Bad Memories, because it is quite understated and very British in nature. Um, it's pretty much single location, which, of course, can and for you did work to your advantage. But with, with mine, he couldn't quite see, OK, how is he going to pitch this? How is he going to sell it? And so I had that in the back of my mind. And I was like, well, is there a way that I could expand the story? And I wonder if in expanding it, would it make it more sellable for the screen? And so I kind of just like mused over that idea. And then I, I came up with a way that I could expand it. And some of the things that happen in it, particularly a specific chapter, I thought, okay, so that will make it even less sellable because there's no way that they're going to film that but at this point i'd already fallen in love with the new idea so i did expand it but i arguably made it even harder to to sell for screen but it you know that that's obviously not the primary reason why we're writing books anyway if that was the primary reason then just write screenplays you know write for the screen i don't know that's not the advice with. they give you now they say make it a book so because no one's gonna finance an original screenplay yeah, it has to be ip that's fucking disgusting i think yeah 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 huh. i yeah that that is that is what they say yeah so i I suppose then that you're right that what I've said is is nonsense if you wanted to write for the screen. In fact, what what some would advise to do is to write for the page and then to adapt it for the screen. Yes. Um, so you've talked about things that have inspired the book, but what is the book about? How would you pitch it to somebody beyond comparing it to other books and movies? Like, what's the premise? So, I mean, th this book is, is about denny who is a new father and so he, he's like coming to grips with parenthood and he has had a very abusive relationship with his stepfather and then he gets a call to find out that his stepfather has passed away simultaneously he starts hallucinating his stepfather, but he's not entirely sure, like, wait, am I hallucinating him? Am I being haunted by him? So he is dealing with childhood trauma. He's dealing with a potential haunting. He's also navigating becoming a new parent, and there are kind of cracks in his marriage as well. So th this is not a good time for Denny. He reluctantly goes down to his hometown and to attend the funeral primarily to support his mother not because he wants anything to do with his stepfather and then as he's in the hometown both his loud-mouthed obnoxious stepsister and a couple of his stepfather's associates because it it's kind of obvious that his stepfather was involved in some sort of organized crime. They start interrogating him about the death of his stepfather and wondering if he may have had some involvement in it. So this guy's day just keeps getting <laughs> worse and worse, all the things that he's having to deal with. And that is kind of the setup to the first half of the novel and i don't want to say too much about the second half because then we'd be getting into spoiler territory but the second half it completely flips genre <laughs> and things 
get a lot more intense. I mean, in, in the first half, it is intense in an almost kind of understated way. And then the second half, it's like all fucks uh, out the window. And yeah, it, it it's a lot more kind of visceral. And yeah, I, I would say it has changed genre. A lot of people have said they didn't expect the turn that it took. It may or may not take another turn and there could be an argument for it changing genre, you know, twice. So there's three different subgenres within the story. So hopefully that gives people a little bit more of an idea as to what it's about. Well, I think it's it's exciting to have like a some type of big jump like that in like the middle of a book. It's just something will things vastly change from the expectations you might have constructed from everything else. I don't know if it happens a lot in books. It happened in a book I'm trying to think of. I read recently. You read it as well. You even had the guest on as, as an episode. Oh, what was that called? It was... You, um, you were about to say Fever House by Keith Frosting. No, but that is one oh, of them. Okay. okay. Um, it was, I think it had Hawk in the title. Oh, are, are you talking about Hawk Mountain by Connor I Habib? Am, I am. Yeah. That has a great, like, tonal shift in the, the last field of it, I would say. Well, it's just, it's fucking just so exciting. And it knocks you off like you'll see it because you're just not expecting it. And the way the rest of the book plays out is just, you could not predict that from what you read previously, I don't think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love it when that happens because I suppose, you know, the, the, the opposite is like, nobody wants to read a book that is just completely formulaic and you know exactly where it's going. So these books that shift tone, that take you on an unexpected ride for, for me, for me, that, that is more exciting fiction. As as I'm saying that, maybe because you know you, you did this before with another comment that I made, I'm, I'm anticipating I'm ready, how yeah. how you might completely argue against what I've said and be like, well, actually, you know, some people they do want to almost have a comfort read and they want to <laughs> read something where where they do know where it's going to us to a certain point, and the if you were to say that, that I would concede that, okay, that, that's a good counterpoint. Why are we even talking if I'm anticipating what you're going to say and responding to it? I don't even need to talk at this point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the majority of audiences do not want to be surprised. They want a template. It's why, like, James Pandelson is the best-selling author mm. of all time. It's why, like, CSI and Law and Order are so popular. It's like those shows have a really specific template, and you know what's going to happen, basically. And that's, like, comforting because they don't have to – be challenged you know they just they know what's going to happen and that's what happens and they could be satisfied with that it's us it's us creeps who want something a little bit different i think yeah yeah and 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 i feel the same with films as well like i love the kill list change genre mm -hmm. a couple of times i love the the 80s film miracle mile effectively begins almost as if it's just a romance and then yeah. becomes like an apocalyptic film and like as as i recall almost it's like there's a phone call and everything changes and it's like just yeah i, he's, I respect uh, he, that i love that <laughs> he's um he's walking past a phone booth and someone at like the nuclear launch web uh site i almost said website <laughs> that's the site they uh call him trying to get somebody else it's a wrong phone number and as soon as uh, that call happens the movie vastly changes but not it also doesn't lose the romance aspect yeah it. it remains a romance but now it's also an action movie a uh, dystopic movie almost it's really fast-paced and thrilling yeah yeah and like i mean it in the uk we've got these long-standing soap operas like eastenders and coronation street i don't know if that means anything to i know the titles 
Yeah, yeah. And obviously there's been like a load of long-standing things in America for some reason, like sitcoms come to mind, sitcoms that now have ended, things like Friends and Seinfeld. But I think it would just be... (laughs) It would be amazing if in any of these like long standing things after 10 years they just decided let let's like change genre let's have a zombie apocalypse just do occur. you do you know that um animated sitcom on FX um Eltril about the spy do you know what I'm talking about I I know what you're talking about and I've I've caught like a few episodes just because, like, I I have friends that really enjoy the show, so sometimes, like, you know, when I'd go round to their house, there'd be an episode of Archer on, but I haven't sat down and watched a lot of it, but I, I guess you're about to tell me it does yeah. something like that. So, so the show is about a spy agency in the U.S. On season five, they, like, almost switched genres and, like, location to real label like selling cocaine in a different country like it, it fucking really jumped to a whole new type of show and it was terrible it stopped being good <laughs> but th- that's like a bad example but it is an example of something like that happening with like a sitcom but yeah so imagine what? if like seinfeld season 17 suddenly began like uh, like it became like hostile or something yeah <laughs> What is the deal awesome. with all of these kids? <laughs> <laughs> oh, but when when that happened with Archer, did did they just do it for a season and then season six they came back as if it hadn't happened, or did they just? I don't know. That? Yeah, I, you you stopped. I, it was so bad you stopped yeah. watching, so you don't even know. Yeah, yeah, we made it like a few episodes in and just kind of gave up. Yeah, no, I'll have I'll have to look into that did they just for season six seven is eight show still on i know it's on netflix which is not it's answering. still going what the fuck okay <laughs> those 15 so it's gonna next year will be the 15th season oh my god wow yeah no it, just... it, it'd be interesting to see if the consensus is that season five got bad and then did they remedy it or did they just double down and and continue but rather than us speculating or what could have happened we could literally watch or read up on what on what happened so people can do that for themselves someone listen many people listening at home will just screaming at us right now like avid fans of this show (laughs) i'll just not happy with what i've said about season five yeah yeah and as i haven't seen it properly like i i can't really disagree with you like i can't agree with you either i just have to it's just like uh cemetery gates is blood money we don't know if it's blood money but we can't say it's not that i i I mean i guess (laughs) i i was gonna say that's true do i i mean it it is it is true i i i highly doubt that it's blood money. There's nothing that. Why am I wasting air? Even why? This how did response? how did this book why? fall into the hands of Cemetery Gates? Okay, so so like to go back to what I was saying before, when I decided to expand it into a novel, so that you 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 didn't you didn't exactly ask this but i think it ties into the original question about kind of what in inspired it so the kind of first half it was inspired or influenced by my childhood drama and then the second half i wrote after going through the most traumatic event of 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 my adulthood probably of my life and that being my divorce and custody battle so this, this like entire book it has been written in a very traumatic headspace just like one half is a different kind of trauma that that influenced it or or if not influenced and affected might be a better word 
But then, do you think it? Do you think that helped with like mental health writing something like that? Was it therapeutic at all? Yeah, I I I think it was cathartic and and therapeutic, and I I think as well, like it kind of benefited the story too. I was thinking about this the other day and how Dallas Mayer, Jack Ketchum spoke about writing from the wound. And I I feel like actually not only writing about this traumatic experience, but, but being able to imbue it with these real emotions and feelings that I was having at the time, I think it added an authenticity to the fiction that when I had distance from it, it I wouldn't have been able to give it. So so yeah, it wasn't it was not only therapeutic, but I think it it benefited the fiction. And I know some people they they say don't write about traumatic things until you've got some distance from it. But for me it feels like it's the the opposite. That Who says that? I've heard people say it. I don't believe you. Well, that's okay. <laughs> we don't have to believe everything that people say. But I, yeah, I should look back at to who, <laughs> who said that because I, I've, I've never heard anyone say that. I've heard people say it. I need. I need. I, <laughs> I, I, be, I, I believe you now. I just haven't. Yeah. I mean, it's just like the blood money of Cementilli Gates. I haven't heard anyone say it, say that, but that doesn't mean no one has said that. I'm pretty sure it was a British author, but that doesn't narrow it down. Ah, Maybe the only ah. British author you know is myself, and then you're you're cool. like people say that, and it's like, was it you? No, it wasn't me. Was it Clive Barker? It, it was not Clive Barker. No, um, I'm out of I, I, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway. Now I've completely forgot what was the original you will question leading, or point where you will, you will tell oh, me yeah. how you got hooked I know, up I, with some material yeah. gates. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, after completing the novel, after showing Ryan it as as always, um I I decided and I say I decided, but actually this was influenced by you, so yeah, we, we were talking about next steps in our career and looking into getting literary agents. And so I thought, well, so, so originally I remember mentioning this to Ryan and like, yeah, he, he said he'd, he wasn't sure that House of Bad Memories was the novel to kind of get a literary agent with. And so then like I, I was looking into to other options, but then pretty quickly I thought, well, you know what? Why not? It's the novel that I have. Why? Why not query some agents? The the worst they can do is say no. And and so I queried some agents, and, and, and like you know, I mean, the, the short version would be that it didn't work out. So the worst yeah. happened, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. I mean. You know, so some things were gained. Uh, like there were some agents that I know from interactions, so I I definitely wouldn't want to <laughs> to work with them. Yeah, who and might I, that be, Michael? Well, no, absolutely no comment. But I I think well, it, it would be unfair to say that we're aligned. Like you know, yeah. I mean that, yeah. that I think that's just the process when trying to find an agent is. Is interacting and communicating with people who might be interested, but also having enough uh, faith in yourself to make the decision of, is this the right uh, agent for me? Like you made that decision with the small press that you withdrew the book yeah. from. I mean, yeah. it's, it's good to have that, uh, that ability to, to do that because I mean, at least when it comes to myself, like, Early on in my career, I was so desperate just to get stuff out that, like, I overlooked uh, red flags, and I just said, "Yes, let's let's do this." And I published with some companies I deeply regret, and I think that can be true for a lot of people who yeah. who work in the small press scene. So 
I think the way you went about it is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm never afraid to choose myself, you know, due to like obviously some bad experiences I've had, some bad experiences that other people have had. And I think that sometimes writers, you know, they'll, they'll put a publisher or an agent or some other arbitrary thing up on a pedestal and that they're, they're, they'll inflate it and really like you you got to respect yourself and respect the work and i mean for for me with the literary agent querying there were some interactions that i had that were very good and they were positive and i liked the agents and you know but for whatever reason it's like you know that they they enjoyed house of bad memories and they thought it was good but it what it wasn't it wasn't for them and that's important you know and I, it's the same with selling something for the screen ryan has said to me it's not enough to have a good story you need to have a great story and not just a great story but one with an obvious vision that he knows how to sell so there's all sorts of different factors that play into it and yeah that there were some agents where it's like as with publishers where i withdrew i don't know that this isn't this isn't working for me this is yeah there's too many red flags and things that i don't agree with i have no confidence in this and you know again like the the choosing myself came into play with with like audio books as well i was looking at different audiobook publishers i got a couple of offers then when i was presented with the contract the contract wasn't good enough i went back and forth i showed it to my lawyer wayne who you know and like yeah it's like the, the, you can't sign this this is the wording that you would need and you know if the pub i i've found in some interactions and i don't know if you have before too but sometimes you even mention a lawyer and the publisher starts to have less interest in what's going on or even less than that like you start questioning dodgy contract terms this is not about anyone specific because this has happened numerous times that suddenly they're not interested or they want to find a way out because you're calling them out on their sketchy terms so anyway the the end result after like numerous publishers being interested in the audiobook is that i'm putting it out independently via this is horror I've got a fantastic narrator, Aubrey Parsons. He has done the ac accent so authentically, and I'm delighted with that. But yeah, after really trying to see if there was an audiobook publisher that that would be, you know, a good match for me, I found out that actually the best match is for me to put this out myself and that's kind of how i felt with the agents as well i thought you know what i am a i'm a better fit i i'm i'm kind of my own agent here i'll query different people i'll look into foreign rights and you know maybe in the future i i mean probably in the future i will query agents again but if i don't think they can do any more for me than i can do for myself then of course like i'm i'm not going to take them on i think you know it's a two-way interview when you're looking for an agent they need to see if you're a good fit but you need to see if they're a good fit which is a very tangential way of getting back to the original question so then after i'd rejected <laughs> the agents i i reached out to cemetery gates media about publishing house of bad memories they thought that it was a good fit they sent me a contract i queried a few things instead of 
Joe is saying, oh, no, you queried the contract. That's it. It's over, <laughs> like some publishers would. We responded. We negotiated. There was a deal. It was signed. There's a book coming out. So, yeah, I mean, I I look at who the potential publishers are and who, who do I think could do a better job than than me putting this out on my own and those are the publishers that i will work with and yeah i mean so far it's been a pretty positive experience with cemetery gates media they paid me joe is receptive to edits and you know the the, the quality particularly of like the front cover in that matte finish is it's pretty good and the only cost was the uh, living with the ethics of profiting from the island of small dead children that cemetery gates owns. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. This we keeps, don't know this that it isn't up. true. <laughs> you keep bringing it back what, to this. They seem to be really focused on like the gate, like the the gates of a cemetery. You have to ask yourself, yeah. what's inside that? What's cemetery beyond the gates? <laughs> that they want to keep gates? locked. locked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, how I got involved with Cemetery Gates was they uh, they posted a front cover on social media, and they were like, "We have this cover, but no book. Someone should pitch us an idea." And it was a, a photo of a kid in a mask in the woods. And I already had the idea of doing a book about a haunted house attraction. And that to me kind of seemed like it would be a good fit. So I sent them the pitch and they said, yes, we like this. We will contract you. But then they uh, also accepted a different pitch by, I believe, V Castro. And she ended up getting that specific cover, which is good because the book I ended up writing would not have fit that. I, <laughs> I originally had, before I even knew about the, before I had the idea to pitch Cemetery Gates, I wanted to write this as a YA book, and it was going to be called Heck House, and it mm. was going to be more about these kids trying to get a, a revenge on this extreme haunted haunt, extreme haunted house because like one of the siblings died, and that's kind of still what happens in the last haunt, but it's really vastly different now in the way it is set up and uh, presented to you. Um, I don't know at what point it kind of occurred to me that instead of, I don't think I pitched it as a YA, so I must have decided to make it mill, uh, grown up focused <laughs> before pitching it to Cemetery Gates. But the book itself is presented as a series of interviews, as if someone is conducting research and what happened at this extreme haunted house. And that was something i've wanted to do for a long time but i never quite knew what would be the best project for that style like if you've read um chuck palanek's rant that's yeah. a good example of how of a book like what i've written um also max brooks's uh zombie books i think a world war z few. yeah and is the the bigfoot one also written like that i'm not sure i'm not hmm. sure I'm told that there's a book called Fantastic Land that's also written in this style, but I have not read Fantastic Land to confirm. But I think it's a fun way to, you know, mix up a narrative and and just kind of make the reader uh, doubt what they were believing, which is always cool. And yeah, I I realize now I wasn't even asked a question. I just began talking, so I don't know where I'm going with this. <laughs> yeah, but I, I had I had wanted to ask you about this kind of epistolary format mm -hmm. and when you decided that was the vehicle, that was the mode to tell the story in. So it yeah, it sounds like I mean it started off as a as a YA story and at that point it wasn't going to be in this format and so no it, it wasn't even going to be in the format when i pitched at the cemetery gates i right. decided i decided to switch it up like several months after uh signing a contract because i think i found it difficult to get like a way into the book that's always the most difficult thing with my own writing is finding the best way to just get into it once I have gotten into like the Phil Skeptical Chapters and I've found like my, my footing, it's usually pretty smooth 
from then on. But with this book, I couldn't, there were so many different things I wanted to tackle. Like I wanted to talk about how this haunted house even became a thing, but I also wanted to talk about what happened after the haunted house closed and so on. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this was the perfect opportunity to finally write my big like interview book. And it also, I, th I think I always thought when I would write one of these types of books, that one of the main um, people being interviewed would be someone in prison. And I was able to use that idea mm. to kind of branch off with The Last Haunt by making someone in The Last Haunt in prison when they were being interviewed. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, talking about kind of having a difficulty getting getting the writing started i mean i i i've wanted to bring this up and th this is a heavy topic that we're about to jump into but i mean i know that when your mother died it's been difficult for yeah. you to to start stories to write to really creatively get things done in that manner if I'm overstepping, we can obviously no, cut no. any of this out. But I mean, I want to know how you're doing in that respect. I mean, it, this this feels like, from what I understand, it, it it's the first kind of lung story that you've written post the yeah. death of your mother. And I mean, has... I, I don't know if cathartic is the right word here, but has, has that been liberating? Do you feel that you might be able to write other things easier now? How are you doing in that respect? I mean, how the hell are you doing personally as well? I mean, I, I don't think anyone has asked you this in a, an interview because, you know, when it, when it comes to death and when it comes to trauma, people tend to want to tread carefully apart I, um, from me <laughs> <laughs> it's all that blood money that's making you yeah. so brave yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she passed in august and then like september was a complete shit show because i had been back home to uh help my dad do a few things and that was a a complete disaster so uh, no writing was done then obviously but after i got home in i think october maybe late september uh, the desire to write was completely gone i had like forgotten how to and um actually my uh, a friend of mine who was pretty uh, known in the whole genre jay wilburn he passed away in october which was not too long after everything with yeah. my mom and i had been friends with him for over a decade and um, we kind of both began around the same time. And I actually pitched this book the same week he passed away. I mm. don't quite know what prompted me to like, just like reach out and pitch a book, which is why this book is dedicated to him because it kind of made me go and do something. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't really take into account the fact that I had no desire to write anything or quite remembered how to, which is why this book took a long time to write. And any, I mean, beyond this book, I think I've written one short story for the Why Didn't You Just Leave anthology. I think that's the title of it. And... Yeah, I think it was a combo of like grief making it difficult to focus on my own writing and also the fact that this type of book was just extremely difficult to write because I'm someone who loves writing dialogue and I kind of thought, oh, well, a book of just interviews will be fairly easy to write for me because it's all dialogue. But it turns out I only <laughs> like writing dialogue when it's like a conversation. So like, yeah. When more than one person is speaking, you have like that rhythm you can play with, and yeah. people asking, people responding, and so forth. But in this 
book, The Last Haunt, it's just one person at a time speaking in each section. So I, I quickly realized that I had um, maybe oval steps in what I thought my cunt filled zone was. And it took a long time to figure out how to do that. Also, I was writing it, originally I was trying to write it in a way that I found extremely difficult. Well, I was, um, so the way the book is presented is you have like 15 or 20 kills fields. And all of them have been interviewed by me basically about what happened at the um, McKinley uh, Manal uh, Massacre, which is the, uh, the name of the event that the book is about. And instead of having like chapter one, this is the interview with this kill tool, mm. chapter two, I have everyone's responses kind of edited in and like bouncing back and forth. So it creates a, what I hope is an interesting rhythm and flow of narrative. And uh, when I was first writing this, I, <laughs> I, I had, had a loose outline of what I wanted people to talk about. And I was trying to write it the way the book was published. So I would do like a paragraph of this person responding, and then I would go to a paragraph of someone else responding. I found that so fucking difficult to like keep yeah. bouncing between uh, the cast I have. Eventually, like, like a month and a half ago, <laughs> it dawned on me how much easier it would be if I just, in a separate document, interviewed each kill tool separately and then once all of the interviews were done go back and edit each response so it seemed more um uh, you know like natural and once i did that that was super fucking easy so i think i was just kind of blocked by not quite conceiving of how to write this correctly like um there's one one of the main kill tools name is uh trevor henderson he's the one in prison that's being interviewed i wrote his i, I came up with a list of questions to ask him directly because he's like the protagonist essentially and that was like 15,000 builds of the book, just of his uh, his answers, his interviews. And then everybody else, I kind of considered a side kill tool. Mm. And I came up with a list of like 10 questions I would want all of them to address. And that made it pretty easy to copy and paste the responses into the correct sections and i would change up like who would respond when depending on what type of information was revealed and um just like the length of the response as well yeah and yeah i was very curious as to how you actually did the writing and yeah, yeah to my mind it made most sense to do the interview separately and then to kind of weave it together in some sort of tapestry but i, I wish i wish i had thought of that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i i mean it it works so well and it it really it it, it really replicates like you know the, these film doc documentaries i mean not not just film but re real life documentaries on true crime and you know that they'll, they'll start off and that there's like a hook they'll they'll tell you like there's been some sort of incident, but then we kind of go back to the the beginning and getting to know, you know, the, the McKinley Manor and McKinley himself. And it just, yeah. yeah, it just really seemed to have the rhythm ab absolutely down. And so it is probably the nearest experience like to, to reading one of these documentaries, like it could have been, the transcript for All right. I need I need to mention as well. I mean, for those listening who might be confused, there is a man named Russ McCamey who does who uh, might be loosely uh, inspired by the book. Loosely, uh, very different though, because uh, the kill tool in my book is named uh, Gus McKinley. It's really mm. different, and in no way does that make me um, eligible for a lawsuit. You know, um, I. I'm just, I'm inspired by life and everything that is uh, in existence, essentially. Uh, but I've anything, I've based the book on my own imagination, on the, the entirely uh, fictional Gus McKinley. I just wanted to get that out, Phil. Yeah, well, 
I mean, that, that, that jumps into another direction I wanted to go at, at some point. So, so why not now? You know, when we were speaking about abnormal statistics, your short story collection, you have a number of stories that are loosely based on real life events. You can't yeah. sue him. It's fiction. Um, and the know, subjects of those stories all dead. Yeah, I just remembered <laughs> a, a, a comment you made to me at some point. We we are not going to repeat. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I mean, I'm not going to repeat. I can't control what you do or or, or don't say. You can in post, though. <laughs> that, that is true, actually. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, when, when you're writing... Th this was something that came up in the, the previous conversation, but, I, you know, ab about kind of concerns, in the legal concerns when writing things that are based on like re real life happenings and you didn't seem so concerned when it was like short stories within a collection however yeah. now we've got <laughs> an entire book well we also and, have a book that's gonna draw comparisons to a really social media active human with a rabid fan base of psychopaths. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Russ McCabe, he has a Facebook page and a Facebook group as well. And he has thousands of fans. People love him. Yeah. <laughs> he, they watch his live streams of him just making people do crab walk with dog food bags on the laps. And they just go, ah, oh, this, this is cinema, I guess. I don't know exactly what's going on, Bill. Although, I mean, I kind of know. It's like a, you know... Uh, Difficult to make certain claims without potentially uh, being accused of, um, I don't know, libel, maybe? I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not a loyal. I'm not a judge. I'm just a man who read a book called Last Haunt that's completely, <laughs> completely 100% fiction and not based on anyone in real life named Russ McCamey. That's for sure. Yeah. So if it goes yeah. to court, they can play that it's like he could not have been yeah. more unambiguous he literally said it's not based on russ mccamey so if he said it yeah that's, that's interesting true. so if they do bring me in i'll get a big uh, white build and a dry erase mouth i'll write the name russ mccamey and below that i'll write gus mckinley and the the, the jelly will go ah it's different <laughs> yeah <laughs> um also um my book takes place in texas there's no reference to san diego there's no reference to tennessee really different also it, in real life this this mckamey fella who's really different from the guy in my book he offers a prize of twenty thousand dollars in my book the prize is fifty thousand <laughs> <laughs> i'm fucked <laughs> very very different you know yeah. if you don't think that's different then you know, you try promising someone twenty thousand dollars, and then you give them fifteen thousand, and they're not going to be happy. So it is. I just thought of something else as a, a key difference. So one of the the big attractions at this uh, haunted house of Russ's is called Rat Race. And basically, there's a tiny maze in his in his in his grass, like a body can crawl through, and you have to get it to the end of the maze. And then a bucket of, of rats will fall on your face. And the whole time, he's spraying you in the face and essentially a waddle building you so you can't breathe. And my book falls an attraction <laughs> called Scorpion Scramble. <laughs> and <laughs> essentially, it's a tiny maze in the guy's grass <laughs> that you have to crawl through. And at the end, a bucket of scorpions supposedly falls at you. And the whole time, uh, uh, Gus McKinley is spraying you in the face with a hose. <laughs> but there are no rats in that scene. No rats. So no rats. Completely different. It's just storytelling. Some would claim no rats exist at McCamey Manor. I've it's all a ruse because no one's ever made it to the end of that. 
Except one guy did, who's a famous uh, YouTuber who's in the process of kind of destroying Russ, a guy named Reckless Ben. He did make it through, and he was taking them to the haunt. He was finally taking them to this magical haunted house that supposedly is real when uh, his uh, camera badly died. And, uh, oh well, you can't do the haunt now. And Perhaps it's a scene really similar to that in my book, but um, perhaps not. Maybe you would just have to read the book. The mill I talk, the mill I, I, <laughs> I, make, a, I make a case against myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, another thing in terms of, I guess, like playing with fact and fiction is all of the characters who are recounting their experiences they have the name of someone in real life. That's you know, true. It, it, it would appear like, you know, personal friends and acquaintances of yours, even if, you know, that the character in the book is vastly different <laughs> from, yeah. from the actual person. We, so, I mean, we ha assume. Ha we assume they're all vastly different. So, how did that. <laughs> How did that part come about? And in terms of each character, did you know? Did you just contact the person with the real life name? And <laughs> no, <laughs> he's shaking his head. I, uh, I, I hate I hate coming up with names. I'm really lazy, and I like naming people off of friends of mine. Um, then once I do name someone after someone I know. I love just making them as terrible as possible. Yeah. Like uh my friend John Balt is really yeah. cool. he's in it and um <laughs> how his kill tool his name is kind of funny. Um do you think I need to explain what the Midnight Society is? Um yeah because I I, I think it is quite niche even though Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's a uh, it's a social media account I guess. Um, will they take f famous uh, hill uh, fields and they position them around like a campfire and via text they do conversations with these uh, real life humans but as fictional kill tools so, like they'll have like Stephen King and Lovecraft uh, fighting about something of the little campfire. I've been a kill tool a few times uh, many of my friends have been but uh, for some reason, which is really funny to me, she made uh, John a, a cop in it. He's really vastly anti-cop. And he was so upset when this happened. He's a friend of mine. Like he, also, he lives in Austin, so I see him in real life quite a bit. And the day that went live, we met up at some, uh, as you would call it, Michael, a pub. We met, right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm translating myself so you understand. So we met up at this this pub and he was really bummed <laughs> like he was genuinely upset that they were calling him a cop but it was obviously a comedy thing it wasn't serious uh so it when it was time to name the cop kill tool in my book it was like a week after <laughs> this had happened and it it seemed too uh good to pass up so i made him the cop and just to, to give you one funny uh, anecdote, uh, when I announced this book like two weeks ago when I finished it, and the book's already coming out, I don't know how this has happened, but that's what's happened, uh, John commented saying, hell yeah, this book is going to be great. And I replied, I named a kill to left to you. And he was like, oh, I'm truly honored. <laughs> then I sent him a screenshot. No, so I said, you will not going to like it. And then he found <laughs> me and he DM'd me and said, it's a fucking cop. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Andrew is a little pal of mine, Andrew Hillbilt. He said his feelings were crushed when he found out that he wasn't included in the book. So I quickly changed someone's name to, to Andrew, and he happens to be one of the most awful people in the book. The like his intro section is like talking about coming on some crazy lady's face. It's <laughs> uh, it's not pleasant text to read, uh, but it's fun to make. Uh, people you like, uh, terrible humans. Yeah, and in terms of like other people, like Betty Rocksteady, who in in this book, the character Betty Rocksteady is like the biggest fan of Gus McKinley, and like, I mean, ha did did everyone kind of just find out that they were in the book because you like sent them? 
a copy when it was done or like did some people know during the writing that they were going to be included betty knew because we tend to talk uh every day and we'll usually provide like updates and what we were writing and she said she wanted to be in it and i said okay i'm gonna make you a terrible human and she was like fuck yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> and i knew i wanted like an obsessive maniac to do like to be like the mod of the facebook group the mckinley uh main old facebook group and yeah. she seemed like a good fit for that because full name is already fake sounding so a <laughs> mod of a facebook group seems like a good fit for a fake sounding name there you go yeah is, is this when you tell me that you will crushed you will now the kill chill on it it's okay i i can no. i can withstand it and i'll tell you why I almost did. You did. But, uh, oh, I, I almost. I almost. But um, I have my friend Miguel. My Ma- Miguel Miles. He's a kill tool. And Miguel is is is, is Michael. I didn't yeah. Want of, <laughs> I, didn't want, I didn't want two of those names. So you had you had to make a decision, Miguel or Michael, and it's like, well, Miguel lives a a hell of a lot nearer to you, so. One of one of you guys. Well, he's just a better help, human being. He's just one better. of you You're help like... out a lot at the bookshop I ran, and one of you have you've never done a shift. Yeah, I'll just say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Haven't even popped in. Absolute terrible friend. Definition of a great friend. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, to kind of go back to what I was saying about you write writing and having struggles writing previously are you working on anything new now and do you feel now that you've written the last haunt do you think it might be easier for you to return to writing is it still difficult when you sit down to write to work on a project um no i i think i found my flow again i think i had to get like a difficult thing out of my system and I'm not going to claim it's going to be easy going field because writing is never really easy. Yeah. But I think I am back on track again. It's also just difficult finding time to write. We uh we run a bookshop. We we publish a lot of books every year, and all that takes a lot of time. And you wake up with all these ideas of things you want to get done in, in the day. <laughs> then the day is done. And all you've managed to do is a uh, copy and paste information for a, uh, a gift exchange on your little Discord. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I just sold a new uh, pitch, I guess, to Apocalypse Crowley for a book I'm supposed to be writing them called i believe in mystical bones mm. so that's a book i need to begin writing i am trying to finish a, a vampire novel that i was writing before my mom passed and i have not touched it since because the uh the premise was way too close to what was going on and i found that yeah. strange the uh yeah so the the premise of the book is um these three siblings they all live they've all drifted the pelt basically and they live different sections of texas and it begins with san antonio getting like a like a news headline not a, uh, oh a trending topic of the real vampire because these bodies have been discovered that drain the blood and we follow all three of these brothels who uh read this trending topic and all three of them come to the conclusion oh shit mom's back from the dead and they all go back to the hometown to regroup and figure out what to do and uh <laughs> i didn't see my family in like five or six years and when i went back to indiana because my mom uh dying i kind of regrouped with my two siblings who the siblings in the book <laughs> significantly based on and mm. it felt really bizarre like all oh, this was happening and i just i have not touched that book since mostly i think because i wanted to get the last haunt done and sent mm. it and i just had mill issues writing the last haunt than i anticipated i mean most I mean, it's it's odd because most of this uh book the last haunt 
it was written in September, and the book is coming out in October. I kind of wrote most of it over a weekend after spending 11 months figuring out how to write it. But also, I spent a lot of time researching, watching YouTube videos, yeah. reading interviews, watching documentaries. And I had a shit ton of notes of research of what I wanted to uh recycle but i wanted to uh interpret into my own original fiction that in no ways uh resembles anything in real life yeah yeah well it's so good that you've found your writing groove again or fingers crossed that you have um uh, but i i mean yeah you, you mentioned that you have so many different things going on and you your situation is kind of reminding me of how my situation was. I think it was in about 2016 or so. And I, I, I was going to say I could tell that I was going to burn out. I effectively did burn out because I had like, I was teaching, I was podcasting, I was writing, I was the main person running the This Is Horror website, I was publishing, I was editing, and I just realized that like that there are too many things and like something is going to give and like mm -hmm. one of those things is potentially my health. I mean, it kind of did. And so I really had to kind of like reduce things to what do I actually want to do? What's the most important thing for me? And so that that was when you know, I, I handed over much of the day-to-day -day running of the website to good old Bob Pastorella. And I also, you know, stopped This Is Horror Publishing. The only thing I put out via This Is Horror Publishing is my own <laughs> things right now. I mean, that, that's not like, it's not like a definitive rule that like I'll never <laughs> publish anyone else's stuff again, but that's just how I'm doing things now. And so the, the only things that really remained were like my writing, the podcast, and then like the, you know, the, the day job just, it, it didn't remain because I was passionate about it. It just remained because it's like, well, I, I want some extra income to supplement the other things that I'm doing. So, I mean, I mean, for you, 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 I, I think you've got even more on <laughs> than I had back then. You've got the podcast, you're writing, you're running a bookstore, which is insane to include in a list of things. It's just like a number. You've got the publishing with Ghoulish. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how much freelance editing you're doing now. I, I feel that I'm missing out things that you're doing because you're doing so many things i mean you just launched a brand new ghoulish website so yeah. i mean uh, are, are you... free podcast by the way yeah so are, <laughs> are uh, you we also do the book fest as well yeah yeah so yeah. i mean are, are you taking stock are you trying to focus on what is important to you and and kind of like I mean, you don't necessarily have to cut back or cut off some of the things you're doing. That might be a good idea, but at least kind of front loading the day or your priorities with the stuff that's really important. I, I guess another, another way to put it would be if you could choose only two of those things to keep, which would you choose? What is most important for you? I wouldn't choose. I would refuse because I can. I'm going to do it all. You, see. you have to in this <laughs> hypothetical situation. Are you holding a gun against my? Yes. Head? Yes. Pull it. Pull it. I don't <laughs> want to live. <laughs> this is like a scene from. It's not. We need to do something. That's like a scene from the 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 host, Indiana Death Song. Mm. Yeah, like in, in the car, <laughs> like the, dad, oh, yes. is, oh, the yes. dad is threatening to kill them all and yeah. the, the son, do it, <laughs> kill us. Yeah. I, I was thinking, I don't remember a gun being in that novella. <laughs> um, you know, I, I go through times where I am completely just exhausted and I don't want to do anything, and I go through moments where I have this uh, almost mania of... Uh, 
inspiration and just a desire to do as many cool projects as I can uh, attempt to. And I think what is important to me, like the longer I do stuff like this, is creating a community of people who like spooky shit. And everything I do, outside of maybe the writing with Ghoulish, is cr crafting this community. We do the, the annual book fest, and we have people come out every year now. They come, they repeat people, basically. Uh, we have people coming to the bookshop, and we do like movie screenings every month, and we do all these all these several events, and people get to know each other. These people who love Philly, uh, non mainstream things, I would say, and it's a like a niche community. And I think that's really important, at least to me. And cutting away something only limits that community from growing. So I wouldn't take away anything because all of it goes into making this community a uh, mill uh, vibrant and alive besides maybe r the writing of my own books, but I, I like writing. It's fun. We keep doing it. Yeah. And maybe, maybe uh, someone will pay me to write a screenplay again and then I won't be so stressed about money. <laughs> right. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of your writing, do you have a daily writing routine? Have you crafted some time out where you're like, right, this, even if just no. like, no, okay. <laughs> we, we've done a lot of episodes, I think. And every time you interview me, I think I usually say, my next thing I want to do is figure out a way to, to do a schedule. I have, yeah. not, have, not, have not done it yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we are coming to the end of the time that we have together for this episode. So, I mean, The Last Horn, it is available, I believe, on October the 24th. Mm -hmm. House of Bad Memories is available October 13th. So we would obviously like it if you pre-order both of those books. Or if you're listening in the future, you can order them. There's no pre, just order the oh, book. Post. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I don't know how the the post order is. I mean, that's what just when they're, when they're out. The of, it could be just getting something in the post. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts or things that we didn't cover that you want that is this horror and ghoulish audience to be aware of? Um, just we mentioned it briefly, but I just launched a brand new website that's like the central hub of all things ghoulish. Go to ghoulish, www dot the ghoulish dot l i p rip. There's no com here. It's rip. Go to that website and look around. All right. What about you? In terms of final thoughts. Yeah, man. I mean, really, the 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 the, fi the final thought <laughs> is to to check out the books if you like the idea of a a loosely based on Russ McCamey <laughs> book, then you might want to check out the Last Haunt. If you like dialogue heavy kind of books that change genre halfway through. If you think the, the pitch of funny games meets This Is England, I don't even know how many people know This Is England in, in the US, no but, I, but I feel that e even hearing This Is England, it might conjure up what this could be about. Well, it could be based in England. Maybe that's why <laughs> I primarily did <laughs> this comp. If that's, it's, it's, um, <laughs> Intriguing. It, it then. sounds like what inspired the name for your podcast. This is England. Yeah. Th this is... Dot UK dot CO. Yeah. Yeah. Go to this is horror.co.uk if you want to find out more this is horror stuff. And if you want to support the uh, island of uh, children owned by Cemetery Gates, buy both of your books. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much for listening to Max Booth on This Is Horror. Join us next time when we'll be unveiling the first in our House of Bad Memories weekend podcast series. 
We recorded so many podcasts this past weekend, and you can watch video versions right now, either at our YouTube channel, at This Is Horror Podcast, or at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Speaking of Patreon, it is the best way to support This Is Horror, and you also get to submit questions to each and every interviewee. And coming up soon, we will be chatting to Matthew Holness, a.k.a. Garth Marenghi, and Chuck Paulenick, a.k.a. the author of Fight Club. So if you want to hear those episodes before everyone else, and if you want to submit questions to each of them, become a patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Everyone has a story about post-haste manner. None of them end well, but that doesn't stop the hopeful from hoping and the desperate from trying. This Halloween, authors Jolie Tumajon and Carson Winter present Post-Haste Manor, the history and eulogy of one very haunted house, as recounted by the artists, poets, beloved family pets, and mass murderers who have been touched by it. Raise a glass in celebration. Just don't linger for too long. Post-Haste Manor, out October 18th, from Tenebrous Press. The Washington Post calls our Sheriff Knight, the novel by Mariana Enriquez, a masterpiece of supernatural horror. The New York Times calls the book an enchanting, shattering, once-in-a-lifetime reading experience. And Kazuo Ishiguro, author of Never Let Me Go, calls Enriquez the most exciting discovery I've made in fiction for some time. Our Sheriff Knight is available now. Well, that about does it for another episode. Please do buy my debut novel, House of Bad Memories, if you can. And I podcasted so much over the weekend that I'm kind of losing my voice. I don't know if you can even tell, but yeah, I really would like it if you could support House of Bad Memories. Shout about it on social media. Leave a review on Amazon and all Goodreads and just let people know about it. So until next time, for the House of Bad Memories launch podcast, where we also launch Silent Key by Laurel Hightower, take care of yourselves, be good to one another, read horror, keep on writing, and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.